Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this particular webinar of the IVI webinar series for 2023. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce the topic of AI in the circular economy for our uh, seminar series lectures today. And we, we have a, a very full agenda uh, on, on, our, on our books today. And I want to start off just by making a brief introduction. My name is uh, Peter Mooney and I'm a lecturer here in computer science uh, in Minute University. I am, I'm also a researcher with the Innovation Value Institute and their support for this webinar series is acknowledged, as too is the Environmental Protection Agency who are funding our project, CERC AI, and uh, another project that you will hear a little bit about later. So we have four invited presentations uh, to come from various speakers who are experts within the AI slash circular economy space. But our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Mohammed Salman Patan, who is a senior postdoctoral researcher here in CS. And Salman is the person who is doing all of the work for the CERC AI project. And the next few minutes will be Salman giving an overview of that project. And then we will enter into our four invited speakers. Just to, to let you know, in terms of questions and comments, if you have any questions or comments, please type them into the chat. And after each of the presentations, I, as the moderator, then will will pick and choose some questions, and I will direct them to the to the speakers. And I think the speakers will will welcome uh, questions after the webinar as well. They will leave their contact details uh, with you on their slides. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Salman to give us a brief introduction to the CERC AI project. Thank you, Peter. So you guys can see in the presentation. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we can see it in, in slide mode. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is Mohammed Salman. I'm currently working as a senior postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Computer Science, uh, Minutes University, and one of the team members of Circular Artificial Intelligence Project, which is funded by Environmental Protection Agency Ireland. So, before discussing what circular artificial intelligence is, let me discuss some concept. So, circular economy. The term economy refers to the system of production, consumption, and uh, uh, distribution of services and goods in an entity, whether that entity represents a small village or entire nation. The world's current economy largely operates on linear economic principles. The traditional linear economy follows the take make waste model in which we, uh, we extract the resources from the earth and we manufacture them into the product. And finally, we, uh, we use them for a particular period of time and then disc uh, we discard them as best. This uh, economic models and this economic model encourage poor consumption of natural resources, abundant waste uh, production, and it also creates serious health, biodiversity, and environmental problems also. On the other hand, we have circular economy. The circular economy is defined as a system in which the value of products, materials, and resources is preserved for as long as possible by developing some durable products which can easily be uh, reused and repaired and recycled. In this uh, economic system, the products can be used for a longer period of time and their resources are kept uh, in a closed loop of uh, economy. Uh, in this system, the waste from one product is seen as a resource for another product. Thus, this, uh, this economic system negates the end-of-life approach. Uh, this economic system, circular economy, this economic system uh, reduces the usage of uh, extra uh, natural resources, reduces waste generation, and it, it also enables uh, sustainable economic development. Now, this term, uh, circular economy, is gaining attraction uh, worldwide, and various policies and uh, uh, papers are published also to make a smooth transition from linear to circular economy. And digitalization is one of the crucial uh, one of the crucial enabler in this transition from linear to circular economy, as, um, uh, as identified by one of the reports of Digital Europe that digitalization, digitalization could help in 
achieve 20% uh, reduction in global carbon emissions by 2030. So the digitalization is the use of digital technologies to develop new business models in order to provide new value and uh, uh, revenue gener uh, generating opportunities. Effective utilization of digital technologies such as internet of things, cloud computing, uh, big data, blockchain can enable or implement circular economy in various ways. For example, the, you know, the smart usage of uh, IoT sensors in any sectors can be used to track uh, the usage and vestige of uh, uh, resources like energy, water, and uh, other natural resources in any sector or um, in any um, company so that we can identify uh, some uh, areas uh, in that sector to optimize our resource, resource usage and reduce uh, the uh, uh, vestige. So of all the possible technologies of uh, digitalization, artificial intelligence is one of uh, the technology which has the greatest potential to implement circular economy in real life. As per one of the paper published by Ellen MacArthur Foundation uh, with Google, which is a big name in the, circular, in the field of circular economy, artificial intelligence can help uh, implementing circular economy in three ways. First one is design of new circular products. AI can be helpful in designing new circular products, which, uh, which are based on the characteristic of uh, a circular economy. That is, they can be reused, repaired, and recycled um, easily and for a longer period of time. Using advanced data analytics technique, we can get insights from all the development process of a product. For example, the usage of material, the manufacturing processes, the design patterns, and we can optimize each section uh, uh, as per uh, uh, the circular economy principle, hence the data analysis or data analytics help us in doing better decision making. Secondly is operating circular business models. We already know that artificial intelligence is involved in producing new business models based on circular economy principles. For example, predictive maintenance, any enterprise can use IoT combined with data analytics techniques to get real-time data from the equipments that they are using. And from that real-time data, they can predict the early faults uh, in their machines uh, rather than just uh, um, buying a new machine. So that in that purpose, uh, in, the, in, the, in that scenario, they can increase the lifetime of an equipment used in their uh, company or sector, which is based on circular economy principle. Finally, the optimized optimizing infrastructure the key uh, uh, the key feature of circular economy is that the products materials and sources are kept in the economy for a longer period of time and for that purpose an efficient infrastructure of uh, recycling sorting and treatment is needed and artificial intelligence has already been involved in such kind of uh, uh, scenario and uh, for example ai combined with uh, robotics um, helps in uh, sorting the mixed uh, waste material streams in which the quality recyclables can be detected and they can be used for a longer period of time. So in this way, AI can be helpful in optimizing circular economy uh, CE infrastructure. So uh, Ireland is in its transition towards uh, circular economy and various policies strategies uh, are published by Irish government uh, to implement circular economy economy nationwide, for example, the whole of government circular economy strategy uh, is the key strategy by Irish government in which they are targeting to uh, reduce 50% uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and reach a net zero by 2050. And artificial intelligence is also one of the uh, strategies or one of the focus of Irish government to be used for circular economy. For example, the recent publication of Irish government AI Hair for Good, which is a national, which is a national artificial intelligence strategy for Ireland, ambitious, ambitiously sets out how Ireland can be an international leader in using AI to benefit the Irish economy and society. That strategy has so many themes, stands, and one of the important theme is AI for societal good and sustainability, which recognizes the potential of artificial intelligence in supporting sustainability and includes several initiatives and recommendations for leveraging AI in this domain. So the focus area in terms of climate action and sustainability in that uh, particular um, strategy 
where AI can be used for sustainability is smart energy management, precision agriculture, circular economy, and environmental monitoring. So there are a lot of enterprises in Ireland which are moving towards digitalization and they are embedding artificial intelligence in their business models. And uh, uh, as per a report uh, by Eurostats published in 2021, Ireland has the highest share of uh, enterprises using artificial intelligence in artificial intelligence in Europe. And there are various companies uh, in Ireland who are using artificial intelligence for circular economy. And we have listed a few of them here. Advanced Manufacturing Control System, AMCS, is a solution, a software solution provider company headquartered in Limerick, uh, which, is a, which is also a leading name in the field of uh, uh, waste recycling and uh, resources and they have uh, provided a solution called vision ai which is an automated solution utilizing advanced computer vision techniques to detect the contamination in uh, waste uh, in the waste streams because due to contamination uh, in the uh, recycling uh, waste sometimes some quality recyclables ended up into the landfills so uh, this uh, vision ai system is very efficient in detecting contamination so that the quality recyclables can be sorted properly and we have positive carbon and we have the ceo of positive carbon with us also mark he will further uh, describe his uh, startup in detail but uh, i will describe a little bit positive carbon uh, uses artificial intelligence and leader a type of laser sensing often used in self-driving cars to determine the extent of food with the technology collects and logs the data of food that is thrown into the bins and shows records of every piece of food waste on a reporting dashboard. Actually, what they are doing is to get giving the insights to commercial uh, kitchen owners that what kind of food and in what uh, amount they are wasting so that they can change their food production and uh, consumption pattern in, uh, in order to reduce the food waste. Lastly, we have Sensi, uh, it's an, it's an Irish startup that is specializes uh, in developing a range of reverse vending machines for circular economy. Basically, these reverse vending machines uses IoT sensors combined with uh, computer vision techniques, which can recognize uh, the type of uh, uh, cans, uh, um, type of can and material uh, that the, the user want to recycle and then they reward uh, the user uh, in, in the form of QR code uh, for uh, recycling properly. Salman, so, you have, two, you have, uh, you have two, two minutes left, Salman. Sorry? You have two minutes left. I have to. Yeah, we are circular uh, AI project, and the objective of uh, circular AI, which is funded by Environmental Protection Agency, is to deliver state-of-art reviews of international best practices of AI within C. The what kind of artificial intelligence uh, techniques are used in Ireland and in other countries, uh, and uh, we also want to share the knowledge and provide best practices guidelines how AI can be practically used for. Uh, achieving circular economic goals, and then develop best practices guidance on the sectoral challenges of AI integration in the circular economy domain. And then finally, we will uh, deploy or we will um, develop a website in which we will share all the knowledge of that uh, project uh, that we have gathered, like uh, policy reports, uh, research papers, interviews, and other um, uh, webinar also share the knowledge of how artificial intelligence can potentially influence circular economy. The progress so far, uh, we started in last uh, year, May, uh, and uh, in terms of research, we have presented a one research poster in IVI Summit uh, last year. We have also uh, completed one research paper and we have submitted in a sustainability journal uh, from MDPI publisher. We have also completed one another paper, which we are collaborating with some researchers of Pakistan. And we are targeting the agriculture sector in Pakistan, how AI can be used, how AI is being used in agriculture sector in Pakistan for circular economy. We are also, we are in, we are also collaborating with uh, AI for CE project, which is funded by, by Environmental Protection Agency Ireland in the same domain. And I, the team is from Irish Manufacturing Research, which is a leading name in the field of uh, advanced manufacturing and sustainability. Uh, we also we have also arranged one webinar in the on the same topic uh, last year in Manut uh, University Research Week. So the immediate future plans are we are 
uh, we are joining uh, AI4C public stakeholder workshop on 30th of March, uh, organized by AI4C project and the one of the leading one of the lead researcher of that uh, project is with us, Damien, and he will further define about and uh, describe about this uh, uh, project. We will also uh, organize some stakeholder interviews in the month of April, April and July. And the purpose of that stakeholder interview is to target people from the field of AI and C and to share the knowledge of how they are implementing AI, artificial intelligence for circular economy and what are the hurdles uh, between uh, this implementation. And in autumn, we will also organize an open science event uh, called as AI and Sustainable Future. And after all, uh, getting all the knowledge from these uh, uh, events and we will uh, we uh, we we have planned to write a research second our second research paper in winter uh, um, which will be titled as a and c future recommendations and uh, thank you that's all i hope that i haven't uh, extended the time limit thank, thank you, you uh, thank you very much salman extended a little bit but uh, we'll we'll be a little bit flexible with everybody. I'm just going to hand straight over now to our, our first invited speaker, Dr. Dr. Unikrishnan Madhavan from uh, Trinity College, Dublin. So Unikrishnan, you can share your slides and, and you have 15 minutes and welcome to our, our webinar. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, clearly. That's great. And I hope the slides are shared as well. Perfectly. Thank yeah, you. Great. Uh, so it, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me. It's great to speak in this webinar and to meet all of you. And um, I'm going to talk about the role of circular economy in the sustainable transition of concession sector. So um, I'm a research project manager uh, in Trinity College, but I also have a startup which is called Dr. Concrete, which is about decarbonizing the concrete industry in Ireland. So I would have been working on sustainable concrete for about 10 years now and uh, would like to share um, how circular economy can accelerate the transition. So um, the overview is um, the introduction and a bit about the legislation. Salman has already covered it extensively, so might not cover that in that much detail. And then uh, just look at the challenges and opportunities for CE in uh, concession sector and then how we can use AI as well. So circular economy is all about, I would say it's about, it's something that is there since time immemorial, like certain things that we do, say reusing something, we go to the supermarket, we get a bag and we use it for something else. That is also circular economy. So bringing things back into use, continuing the use of things, and thereby reducing consumption and related pollution is at the heart of circular economy. And also, um, you know, uh, trying to give the power back to natural systems and say incorporating the power of nature through say concepts like circular bioeconomy. So where you have nature-based enterprises or you employ biomimicry. So if you look, circular economy is a very intrinsic and natural thing. So if you look in nature, nothing is ever wasted. Everything is recycled and reused. How would the birds make their nest? They're not going to uh, find out, they're not going to create a new material like concrete, but they're going to take the twigs that are already there around them to create their habitat. So how can we, when we build buildings, how can we incorporate the use of you know, circularity and recycling and upscaling and of materials to actually reduce our impact on the environment, but at the same time, not at the cost of economy or jobs or any of those things. So let's see how these can coexist. So there is, there is like um, policy, which is actually driving um, the whole initiative. And uh, Salman discussed about many of the policies. One of the policies which I want to highlight, which just came out recently, is the European pathway for the concession sector. And 
there they focus on three things one is green construction the second one is digital transition of construction that's where ai and all other digital infrastructure including building information management and using building information management as well as real time sensors or iot sensors become important and resilience so we just had the earthquake in turkey and i know that there was an earthquake in northern india yesterday as well which is not that severe but uh, earthquakes and other natural calamities and other calamities say flooding and other things which are induced by climate change are going to be more and more frequent and how resilient our infrastructure is to those so these are at the heart of the european policy as well apart from that the european waste policy is also there and the corresponding end of waste policy article 28 of epa uh, they discuss uh, the end of waste policy and actually the epa um uh, would have soon their final policy on um uh, on using recycled aggregates so the idea is uh, no concrete uh, made in ireland would be made of virgin materials e every um, batch of concrete that's manufactured in this country should incorporate some recycled materials based on the principles of uh, upscaling and uh, recycling so um is my whole screen visible i just want to make sure because uh, okay that's great yes and, yeah um why do we need ce in concession sector per se so it's because of the current state of concession so this is a statistics not from 22 but 2020 so i know that some of the figures have changed but idea of the linear wasteful chain that we use in concession like salman said earlier in general for how our economics is modeled today is like breaking down mountains and then uh, creating millions of meter cubes of concrete out of this and creating buildings out of it and then whenever they go out of fashion so when you you really don't do much testing as to can the building survive a bit more are the strains and stresses in the materials have they exceeded the limit so without that kind of consideration based on sometimes a narrow consideration you just demolish these buildings they simply go out of fashion and then they end up in landfills and it's about 6.28 million tons of landfills and i was looking at how to present this number and 6.28 million tons so it's some weight right so i was looking 6.28 million tons so what is the weight of one human being around 60 kg if we assume uh, then say this would correspond to the weight of 89 million people this is the annual landfill waste from construction in ireland so that is 89 million people's weight the population of 89 million is close to the population of germany so that much waste construction and demolition waste is available for us to play with and how can we implement this in the construction sector so it's not just about reusing waste like each and every part of the value chain has to be looked at and interventions have to be made say for example when you are preparing um, when you are creating cement there are emissions what could you do is there any way to feed back the carbon dioxide that's produced during the cement manufacture back into the cement itself because carbon dioxide is really uh, reactive with many of the components in cement if you look chemically so is there a way now if you know that uh, the latest ipcc report focuses a lot on carbon capture because it says that despite all our best efforts in the next 10 years itself 1.5 degree would be exceeded and we need to capture as well so and we need to build as well because construction is like one of the basic necessities food clothing and shelter so it is providing shelter it is providing pre people uh, a place of work or bridges or stuff like that so it's quite necessary so is there a way to combine both like rather than buildings and concreting being an emitting activity can it be an absorbing activity can can concrete be carbon negative so that kind of idea is coming through circularity so that's by looking at the value chain as a whole so it's also important that when you produce concrete say in manut you try to use materials that are closer to manut rather than bringing materials from elsewhere 
if there is some local waste that's available in manut and if it, if it has some silica and alumina and a bit of calcium in it can that replace some of the cement so that is at the heart of circular economy and then if by any chance you have to demolish a building of course we discourage demolition and if it is demolished then is there a way that through testing and standardization that you can incorporate some of that waste into concrete. So what I think are the biggest impacts of circular economy is like, first of all, it shortens the supply chain. So if you produce concrete in a locality, you try to bring, because that was the whole idea before, why buildings were different in different parts of the world, because they were made of uh, local know-how, local uh, materials, everything was not the same. Everything was not made of concrete. So it reinvigorates the local economy because say, for example, if uh, County Clare, for example, in the Money Point power plant, there was a lot of tarmac available there with ESB. There was a lot of PFA, pulverized fuel ash available with ESB. So if somebody's building something there, if they are building their expansion project for the new green hydrogen or whatever they want to do there, can they make use of some of those waste materials in the concrete that they're producing in those locations? That's the central idea. And um, uh, another thing is, as I mentioned before, the landfills is a huge problem. Ireland is an island and we don't, land is a scarce resource. Our population is growing. So we don't have any space to waste in landfills. And of course, how it masks the beauty is, is, a, is equally important in such a beautiful country. And uh, so this could also be a solution to landfills in that way. I'm not saying that, um, oh, you see a landfill and you automatically put that. Of course, it requires testing, but testing is not as hard as we think because um, in order to use a batch of concrete, you don't have to test the whole thing. You just have to take a few samples as prescribed in IECN and test them and certify them. And as I mentioned before, um, while we do all this to reduce the emission, so, so I was just roughly working out if say, for example, if you replace 30% of cement in concrete with 30% of recycled materials, you can reduce emissions at least by 30%. That's kind of it because the recycled materials building waste for example, other, other examples, as I mentioned, are PFA, pulverized fuel ash, by burning, uh, if there are uh, legacy waste from coal-fired power plants, then we could use that. Or if iron ore, uh, you know, where the conversion, the smelting of iron happens, and then there is something called slag, which is like a molten liquid. So if you dry and powder it, it's a commercially available product called GGBS, which is used in Ireland to make cement as well. So uh, we could use all those things. So what what I was what I wanted to add is this is this could be an economic activity and the jobs created under this activity are very innovative and also climatically sound and would be particularly attractive to the younger generation and lastly what can ai play in this so construction has really moved like when i was growing up making concrete is completely manual labor so i would have seen construction of slabs without a single machine it could have been done completely by hand mixing and um, hand compaction everything would be completely manual and then there is no quality control uh, there won't be maybe an engineer might not be at site there won't be um, a quality control in terms of what mix is being created it will be more about practice and know-how but now everything is recorded like what materials is being used what uh, what is the strength of that material and based on IoT, you could know what stresses and strain levels are persistent at the material in real time. That's where the scope of data and AI comes. So now if you have an IoT base sensor on a building, you don't have to demolish it. You can just say that, look, the strains have not exceeded this permissible limit. So there's no way that this building has to be demolished at this point of time. So this whole circle economy is also bringing out a concept of negative construction, like stopping unnecessary construction and also constructing with materials that rather absorb carbon dioxide rather than emit more carbon dioxide and again at each and every point in the value chain so say for example what is the shortest route to reach there which manufacturer has uh, vehicles which are electric for example or low emission vehicles for example all these things could be in databases and easily accessed by ai boats and 
uh, could inform each and every uh, decision that's being arrived at in the concession sector. So circular economy itself is a game changer for the concession industry. There are barriers for um, uh, concession companies to um, adopt some of this, uh, some of which are like, um, you know, the lack of research infrastructure, because yes, to use the waste products and non-standard testing to get the ISA in a pool. So there needs to be more collaboration with, um, you know, with researchers. So there's a, re there's a gap there uh, in terms of uh, skills, uh, but uh, the policy is definitely in that direction. And uh, the direction of concession is, as the European pathway shows, it is towards greener, digital, and resilient infrastructure. So feel free to ask any questions at the end, but thank you so much. Yuni Krishnan, thank you very much. Uh, that was a very clear and uh, concise presentation. If there is some questions, uh, the webinar audience can type them into the Q&A uh, chat box. It, as we wait for a question, uh, Uni Christian, one that's come in just on my own my own thinking here. You, you mentioned about that collaboration with with research ar around closing the gap between what you have on your slide there about how AI can be used. H how big is that gap at the moment? Is it something that can be closed in the short term, or is this a a really long-term ambition in terms of, of bringing research and, and industry closer together? So concession is becoming more and more digital. So in a, um, say for example, any new building, especially the ones with uh, energy weightings, so would have sensors actually built into them. So these days, every building is a treasure trove of data. So actually that gap is not that wide in terms of AI implementation, but in terms of incorporating waste materials, there is a bit more, uh, it's a difficult, more difficult gap because that is more like the infra is not there. The, the AI technology is becoming more and more universal. And I think that gap could be closed easily than the gap in incorporating waste materials into concrete. That's where, because if a material is waste, unless and until EPA gives the EOW, it is not, it cannot be used in construction. So that is a major piece. How can, and uh, so that's one thing. And secondly is once it's non-standard, where is the manpower? who is skilled to test non-standard concrete and where is the manpower who can design the value chain. So that's where I think uh, more collaboration and more synergy is required. Yeah, so lots of lots of exciting opportunities, but there, there is, a, as you said, the gap is not as, as wide as, as it, it may first appear. In, in the absence of, of questions, uh, I will, will thank you for your, your presentation, Uni Krishnan, and I'm sure you'll uh, be happy to answer any questions offline for, for the audience who, uh, who want to learn more about your, your own research and your own startup. So thank you again for your contribution. And we will move on to the next speaker now, which is uh, Mr. Mark Kerwin. And uh, Mark is Managing Director of Positive Carbon. He was mentioned a few minutes ago in... Uh, Salman's presentation. So it's over to you, Mark, for 15 minutes. See. And welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So my name's Mark. I am the co-founder of Positive Carbon. So we work with commercial kitchens to help them eliminate their food waste. So, so yeah, Positive Carbon was set up by me and my co-founder, Ashling in May 2020. Um, in the depths of the pandemic, we previously worked in the food waste space for the previous 10 years, um, working with companies across Ireland, the UK, Australia and Chile, um, primarily in groceries, so FMCG. So we worked with the likes of Tesco, Food Cloud, Lidl and Aldi, and that was essentially to help them figure out what they were wasting. And it was at that stage that we realized that in supermarkets, they can scan in and scan out absolutely everything. And that enabled them to run some really powerful analytics on what they weren't using. But if you look at prepared food, because you have people buying in ingredients, transforming them into menu items, blah, blah, blah. 
it's very difficult to track what goes on. So that was kind of the birth of positive carbon. So if we touch on food waste first, um, it's a massive problem. So 33% of global food production is wasted and that impacts every aspect of society. Land use used to grow global food waste is three times the size of the Amazon. Global food waste emissions are eight to 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, food produced but not eaten could feed 2 billion people, yet almost a billion people um, go hungry every night. And global food waste contributes almost 6% to global GDP. So it's an absolutely massive waste. And it's essential that we fix it if we're going to hit our 2050 decarbonization targets. So if you look at commercial kitchens, they account for about 25% of global food waste. So overproduction and spoilage cause most losses. So spoilage is where you buy too much and don't use it. And overproduction is where you cook too much food and don't sell it. So this is fully preventable if you have the right tools to tell you what you're preparing, what you're purchasing, so that nothing goes to waste. And if we look at that in the figures, it's about 21 billion euros each year um, just in the EU alone on food waste. So decarbonizing hospitality is very complicated. Um, commercial kitchens struggle to address food waste due to an inability to efficiently track and optimize purchasing and consumption. So most places use manual waste segregation, weighing and data entry. So that's basically a paper form or an Excel sheet or maybe an iPad app where they enter what they didn't use that day. It's very time consuming and um, it's labor intensive and there tends to be a low compliance because kitchens are very busy and very hardworking environments. So finding the time for this can sometimes be difficult. And then there's also camera based waste trackers, which are less bulky, but they still require some work. Of intervention. So we have Flawless, which is our patented deep tech innovation. Um, it's the world's first real-time ceiling mounted tracker for commercial kitchens, um, installed above the bin in seconds, and it captures and analyzes everything that goes into the bin. So we use full volumetric and weight capture um, using our patented LiDAR technology. Um, ML on that level um, allows us to increase the quality of the LiDAR. I have a quick video here if this works. Let's see here now. Does it work on Zoom? does not work on Zoom. It essentially allows us to increase the quality of the point cloud and to be able to accurately determine the volume of what goes into the bin. So that all feeds true using our object detection into our platform where customers can see line level of what food waste they are producing. So you'll see here, um, we can detect from over 500 food types to accurately identify every single thing um, that goes into the bin. We can calculate the amount, the cost, the impact, um, and that's just using your object recognition. Um, we have analytics and insights so that they can predict and see what's going to happen um, and what's going on in the future. Uh, we have zero day API and inventory integrations so we can connect directly to what you're purchasing. And that's quite good. So at the start, when you're trying to essentially identify something using object recognition, if you don't know what people are buying in, you have to try everything. But if you know what people specifically bought that day and you know what's in the kitchen, it enables you to improve the accuracy and quality of your object recognition. So, yeah, that allows us to see exactly what they're buying, if they used it, if they bought it, if they sold it, if they waste. And then waste analysis and diversion. So that's essentially where the waste goes as well. Um, and then also built into the platform as well, we have ML powered waste reduction techniques. So for every single item, um, our system suggests methods of reduction and reuse for foods that you are not using. So that's fully powered by AI. So any food you have, it'll come up with a suggestion for how you to reuse it. For example, beef, transform leftovers into chili. Um, it seems obvious, but it's good to have these things written down as well. So we're a positive carbon. We're enabling a transformative shift in food waste management. So by improving food waste transparency, um, kitchens will reduce food waste, which will reduce their environmental impact by a massive amount. But not only that, it'll also increase the gross profits of the kitchen because every single time you throw something away, you're throwing away money. So if you can reduce the amount that you spend on things that you're not using, you can increase the profitability of your business. And um, it seamlessly integrates into all commercial kitchens with zero staff interaction because it sits on the ceiling. Nothing happens. You can install it in your kitchen and straight away start seeing what you're not using. And it's 90% accurate. So obviously what goes in sometimes can be obscured. It can be dark. Someone can be standing over the bin. So there is a little bit of error. Um, we have a loyal customer base with long-term goals. So we work with enterprises. 
um, which may not be incredibly obvious, but workplaces have some of the largest kitchens, if not the largest kitchens um, in the country. We work with some large hotel chains that it's beneficial for them to reduce their food waste. And we also work with universities such as UCD, Trinity, UCC, and a couple of others as well. So yeah, that's us. I guess in, in summary, over the past year, to, to sum it up, what's helped us is we've tracked over nearly a million um, waste events. So that time something has been put into a bin. And if you just imagine um, the amount of work and effort that would take to, it would just be impossible to do that if it was manually based. And yeah, that's us. Thank you very much. Mark, thanks a lot for that uh, very interesting and uh, in enlightening presentation. Uh, to the webinar audience, we have a little bit of time if you want to type in some questions into the Q&A. Uh, I suppose as, as moderator myself, I, an, an initial question, and it, it's responding to some of your statistics when, when we think about the, the global impact of, of overproduction and spoilage. And even if we just think about it in our own kitchen at home, maybe the things that we, we throw into the bin because we forget what we're cooking tomorrow or change our minds. In, it, you were mentioning then about the, the, the 1 million food waste events that, that you're capturing, are you, are you then using that type of information to, I suppose, further train models or to, you know, gain, gain new ideas about what's happening in the kitchen or, or what happens to that data, I suppose, uh, if, if you can talk about that aspect of the work? Yeah, so it's a continuously improving um, data set. So there's always some getting it started when you go into a place. Um, so say, for example, if we move to a new country that doesn't use the same ingredients or the same um, foods as us, um, you have to retrain that. And it depends on the kitchens. Luckily for us, like hotels are a lot easier to work with than consumers, because if you look at the variety of ingredients that a hotel purchases, um, largely it's the same things with maybe like 10 to 20 percent difference hotel to hotel, which for people in houses and stuff, I don't think you would get that. <laughs> My house versus your house could have a very different looking fridge, right? <laughs> and and in terms of the, the, the installation of the, the actual physical camera equipment, mm -hmm. is there much of a disruption to the physical kitchen to allow this or, or what types of kitchens are, are best suited to this? Uh, can it go into any kitchen or is it a particular, yeah. particular type of kitchen no any commercial kitchen and it's absolutely seamless so we go in after service and um, we install it on the ceiling it's about the size of a fire alarm and um, and then it just starts tracking the waste like it's it's the same for all these things these are long-term projects so the first step for a lot of kitchens is to get a baseline and to get an accurate real world baseline that just of how the kitchen operates for one month two months three months 12 months and that's part of the nature of making it as seamless as possible. So no change to the kitchen environment because it's, we don't want people changing their behaviors sometimes because they think they have to like log the waste and then, you know, they don't log it or it's too difficult or they don't have the time. Um, but yeah, we, there's been no kitchens that we've been able to install. By our households, we don't do households at all. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we have a question in uh, in the chat from, from David and uh, I think you will be able to read this as well, but I'm just going to read it out for the benefit of, of everyone on the, on the webinar. Could you comment about your US market penetration or prospects? Maybe how you're using qualitative workplace and UX data to, to affect the, the engineering workflow? And uh, how would you identify new profit centers or, or efficiencies? So there's a couple of questions there. You could choose to answer all or, or a selection. Yeah, so what is your US market penetration and prospects? So we are exploring that at the moment. Um, it's no mystery that the US is probably the largest waster of food um, in the world. And there's a big opportunity there in helping them and businesses there being able to reduce it. And um, we actually gave a talk in America last year and it was from a research institute over there, but they said food waste was probably one of the most likely to succeed types of businesses because it cuts through the sustainability um, agenda in terms of that when you're talking to businesses that don't necessarily care about circular economy or care about um, sustainability, 
at the end of the day, if they reduce their food waste, while it still does reduce their impact on the planet, it also increases their profits. So it, it's a win-win when communicating to them, I think. Um, how are you using qualitative workplace and UX data to affect engineering business workflow and identify new profit centers and efficiencies? So what do you mean, can David type more, what do you mean by qualitative workplace and UX data? Or... So perhaps it may be the, the behavior of maybe the people in the kitchens or uh, attitudes maybe, but we can let David uh, type an additional yeah, I guess uh, in, comment. In terms of like um, our design philosophy and our product philosophy is we want to make it as easy as possible for the kitchen and we want to start in the kitchen um, for monitoring and reducing the food waste. So it's built around chefs, it's built around... Um, kitchen porters, build around sous chefs to enable them to track this information in a way that just is as seamless as possible. And then the next stage is also integrating that into their daily routine. So whether it's using a dashboard, which we have a full suite of dashboards, or whether it's an email um, report that's then printed out, or whether it's even SMS alerts. So it's just a variety of ways to integrate into the kitchen um, that works well for them. Like some kitchens might not even have a laptop or a computer. And you got it. They still need the information or want the information. So it's the best way to get it to them. That's great. Thanks a lot, Mark. I think uh, just to follow up, just a very quick last uh, comment from David. He, he gave the example of the farm market circularity of, uh, of food waste as, a, as an example of uh, one of the uh, trying to give an example for for his question there so uh i'm Oof. not sure if you can you can comment on the, the farm market circularity of of food waste and that I, we do have that built into the system of the destination which ties into the circularity as well but for, for our aspect of circularity um we work less on the valorization and the reuse and we work more on the reduction element as well because we see the hierarchy first you want to reduce your unnecessary consumption and then obviously and then send what you do, what little waste you do have left to potentially compost or, yeah. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for that. And thanks to David for, for those questions. I'll, I'll close your presentation now and thank you again for, for a, an excellent presentation and your contribution. And I'm sure you're, you'd welcome uh, offline questions from, uh, from the audience also. So the next uh, speaker, is Dr. Damien Coughlin, and Damien is a circular economy technologist uh, with uh, Irish Manufacturing Research. And as Salman mentioned earlier, our, our two projects are working closely together, uh, supported by the EPA. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Damien right now. So Damien, welcome to the, the webinar, and we look forward to the next 15 minutes from yourself. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Can you see my screen okay there? We can see it clearly and we can hear you clearly. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll just give you a bit of background. Zoom error message. Um, sorry, another message. Um, okay, let's give you a bit of background about um, Irish manufacturing research. Um, we're a high technological readiness level research centre funded by Enterprise Ireland and the IDA. Um, we have two locations, one in Ratcool and one in Mullingar in County Westmead. Um, our, kind of, our core thematic areas are digitization uh, and control and sustainable manufacturing. So just a few highlights from, from IMR. We've like 80 plus highly skilled researchers. Uh, we have 40 plus active partnerships with industry. We have 8.5 million in competitive R&D funding has been won. Um, we have a 300 plus member industry network and we do outreach like 5,000 plus students over the last few years. We do quite a few things. Um, today, let's talk about the AI4C project. So it's a collaboration between sustainable manufacturing and um, just to give you an overview of what we do in sustainable manufacturing. Um, it's, it's our ethos is based on enabling transition to net zero for industry in Ireland. Um, we hope we help to achieve this by creating an ecosystem to demystify, de-risk and deliver the transition. Um, and we enable this through our 
expertise in circular economy, um, energy and water. And our data analytics team then works in the areas of like machine learning, digital twins, predictive analytics, optimization, among others. So, as Peter mentioned, we are running this EPA funded project, which is part of facilitating a green and circular economy um, under the artificial intelligence, so the circular economy in Ireland call topic. So, our project um, aims to create a roadmap for empowering the new possibilities unlocked by AI um, in order to leverage a circular economy in Ireland. So as part of that, our project will be doing a, a state-of-the-art review and then developing registered potential opportunities for using AI in Irish industry sectors, and then identifying barriers and success factors to the wider implementation of AI technologies in, in Irish manufacturing sector and then looking at some policy recommendations, but the overall output is basically an AI readiness framework to determine maturity on AI, and this will be driven with industry involvement and stakeholders. Um, just a bit of background on our team. Um, David McCormack, who's the Director of Sustainable Manufacturing, and Carlos Garcia, who's our Senior Research Technologist for AI, are the principal in investigators for this project. Um, I am the program manager and uh, with collaboration from my colleagues, Geraldine and Amanda. So what we we're looking at is like, um, and Simon already mentioned about the, how AI can facilitate a circular economy. So we're all kind of working off the same um, data and information like with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, looking at like opportunities and examples identified such as design circular products, components, materials, using machine learning. Um, we can implement AI with circular business models where it can improve predictive maintenance, can improve product lifetimes. Um, and we're looking at like optimizing infrastructure by using AI to improve supply chains and reverse logistics and waste and resorting um, operations. So we have basically kind of gathered a, this is an example of our circular economy and artificial intelligence roadmap. So we have like different things and these have all been alluded to in the previous presentations as well. Like there's obviously benefits for AI and circular economy and environmental impact analysis and monitoring, uh, big data, smart inventory management, automated optimized delivery, um, recycling classification, tracking and traceability. So these are what we, we know and we will be using um, I suppose our expertise within sustainable manufacturing is um, with the Circulera, which is the national platform for circular circular manufacturing and economy in Ireland. It was launched in 2020. So this is a cross-sectoral um, industry-led public-private innovation network. We have over 50 members um, ranging from like micro enterprises, to SMEs, to NNCs, and it's quite a varied group of um, different sectors from automotive to textiles to consumer goods to medical devices and agri-food. So we have a very interesting network there. So we'll be using this network to gather and get information and stakeholder engagement as well to figure out um, where AI is being used in industry to, to create a circular economy. Um, and as part of that, then, I just to give an example of one of our members, um, or FPD recycling. Um, FPD are a member of Circular and develop automated recycling solutions in the area of waste electronics and electrical equipment. So they use AI powered automation and technology such as computer vision um, to sort waste. So um, FPD were awarded funding by our innovation fund um, in 2021 for their robo CRM proposal. Um, the Robo CRM project developed an AI powered sorting system for electric and battery powered drills in waste systems, because as we know, um, batteries in our waste streams are causing, are problematic and hazardous and are leading to fires and other such dangerous events. So this was, project was part of developing a system for that. Um, and then FPD were able to harness the kind of research that the, the the outcomes that they learned from this project to win further funding through a DTIF 
for um, an expat project, um, which is quite substantial. So the Innovation Fund helped to create um, something that was able to be scaled up into a bigger project. Um, and coming near the end of my presentation now, but Peter said it was okay to publicize our event um, next Thursday. Um, we have a few places left. It's about artificial intelligence for the circular economy. It's a public innovation workshop where we'll be looking at kind of the key enablers to drive AI. Um, and we're going to be pretty much having a workshop on looking at the enablers and risks and barriers to um, implementing AI in industry for circular economy. So it should be a very interesting event. We have several speakers. Peter will be there. I think Salman's there as well. So it'll be an interesting event with um, speakers from our own um, AI division in, in Irish manufacturing research and showing some use cases. So it promises to be a, a very interesting afternoon. So I'll, I can share the registration link afterwards in the chat if anyone is interested in signing up. And thank you. And any information, if you require any information, you can get us at the IFRC at IMR.ie or you can contact me directly at damien.cockman.imr.ie. Thank you very much for listening. Damien, thank you very much. Uh, very nice overview of, of IMR, but also of, of the AI for, for CE project. And uh, absolutely, we have no problem in, in, in publicizing your event for, for next week. We're, we're looking forward to it. I, I invite uh, some, uh, some questions uh, from the, the the audience and uh, they can be typed into the Q&A chat box at, at the moment and uh, just just while we're waiting Damien uh, and I've just noticed that we we have a, a hand up from from David Silverman so I think David we can hear 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 your question directly I think uh, I'm not sure I'd have to whether I have to press something so, uh, Carol, you can give David permission to uh, to ask his question there because we have a couple of minutes uh, time. Sure, Peter. I'm learning Zoom on the on the go here. I'm hearing nothing here anyway on my side. No, not, not hearing anything yet. Just while we're waiting, Damien, I, I suppose a question uh, from myself. In terms of your, your, your own experience now, given that IMR have, you know, Quite a wide network and, and collaboration with with industry in Ireland. What's your feeling around the penetration of AI in general? Is it something that most companies are are involved with, or is it still something that is in the minority rather than the majority? Um, I, like from my own understanding, it's 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 in the it's in the minority in kind of across all the sectors, but in certain sectors, it's very much in the majority with it's driving process improvements and efficiencies in manufacturing. So I think like what, what Mark was describing with his with positive carbon, people are beginning to realize that there's value to be applied with AI and, and circular economy practices throughout industry, like with agri-food and with food waste. So I think it's, it's kind of that uptake, it's supposed to focus that AI can be used for other um, benefits as well. Like we know with waste management, um, computer vision has transformed that industry because it's been able to sort waste, all types of waste. Um, and it just makes it more efficient because that that that, that sector always suffered from, um, you know, high labor costs because it's very manual work like, and it's dangerous work as well and not very clean. And so it's actually something like AI make drives massive value for a lot of that, even though the initial capital expenditure is 
quite huge, but a lot of companies now like FPD are developing solutions for the waste sector. So that's driving that. So it's helping. So I think certain sectors are adapting it much quicker because they need to, um, which is waste the waste management sector. But I think other other industries are slowly kind of understanding that there is benefit there. Because it's 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 you know, we can do a lot with energy and water, but with circular economy it can be quite difficult to see how you implement AI practices to drive, you know, waste reduction or better waste use. So it's yeah, it's definitely it's definitely on the uptake anyway, I think. Yes. Yeah. I think the, David will will type a, a question into the the, the Q and A. I just think it's it's there. Uh, so so David's question, I'll just again read it out for the benefit of of the audience. Can you address how the international manufacturing extension services and education institutions are adopting these AI integration methods and emerging standards? And essentially, where does the Irish program fit? You might be able to see that in the Q and A, so you can. Uh, uh, absorb the question yourself, uh, Damien. Yeah, I, I'm just looking. Um, I can't. I can't answer directly to it with like education institutions because we're we're applied research. So we work. We do research for industry. We don't do research like with say standard academic research. So it's very much driven by results and output and money savings and that. So um, I, th I think we many like. Artificial intelligence has been adopted more, and I think um, Malhak can speak more to it than I would, because um, our, our, the work she has done on it is quite it's excellent. So it's kind of given us all an insight into how circular economy and AI can merge and what, what's important. Um, so yeah, I can't really give a direct answer for, to David for that. Okay, Damien, thanks for that. I think, well, th th that then gives us the opportunity to uh, to move on to the, the next presentation. But Damien, thanks again for, for your contribution. And again, uh, we will uh, invite you to post the, the, the link into the chat there for, for your event next week. And uh, thank you again for your participation. So I'm, I'm going to move on to our final speaker uh, of the day, which is uh, Miss Malahat Goreshki. And I apologize for my pronunciation, but uh, Malahat is a, a senior lecturer in uh, the LAB University of Applied Sciences in Finland. So Malahat, welcome to the webinar. And uh, we look forward to the next 15 minutes in hearing about the opportunities for AI for circular product design. Yeah, thanks, Peter, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. It's good to... Uh be here and listening, of course, to everybody's uh, contribution and discussion about AI and circular economy. Uh, I start sharing, sharing my screen, and, uh, so I believe you can see it now. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, uh, today I will discuss about, I will present about the opportunities of artificial intelligence and, and for circular product design. So a brief uh, introduction about myself, maybe. I am a senior lecturer, as Peter said, at uh, Lab University of Applied Sciences in Finland. So uh, my background of master's degree is on industrial engineering, uh, where I have done my master's thesis about AI, uh, assessing the role of AI in circular product design. And then I continued as a uh, doctoral or PhD uh, researcher in the field of uh, AI and circular economy and circular ecosystems. Uh, and so I'm currently working on the dissertation and defense. And also I am teaching courses uh, in the sustainable solutions engineering program that we have and uh, incorporate social responsibilities and uh, digitalization, circular economy, AI circular economy, and, and so on. So feel free to con contact if you have any questions and for further information about the program but yeah about the product design and circular economy so uh well every all of us know about these uh why the goal of circular economy as such because we want to reduce the waste and we want to maximize the uh, value of the product we want to extend the life cycles of the product to reduce the extraction of these um 
raw material and use of the resources and, and reduce the emission as such and also the uh, like energy costs. So for these, uh, for example, these, according to this European Commission, what they had uh, identified was that over 80% of the products uh, environmental impact is uh, actually determined and identified in their uh, design phase. Uh, for which uh, this Bokken at all, like if you know Nancy Bokken, she is also a leading uh, researcher in the circular economy. So they found that, of course, the products should be designed according to closing the resource fl flows and uh, slowing down the resource flows and also narrowing down. So for the narrowing down, we have to uh, uh, like uh, reduce the uh, extraction of the natural resources, whereas for the slowing resource uh, flows, we want it to the product to stay in the loop as long as possible. So we want to extend the life cycle of the products and for the closing the loop, we want to have like uh, the products to get back in the cycle. So as such, using this recycling and upcycling methods. But uh, then we have, we, uh, they also uh, identified that these products that are uh, actually designed for circularity should be uh, designed for as such increasing material efficiency or product life extension and also improving the life uh, recycling uh, efficiency. And um, based on that, uh, there is this tool that uh, uh, Van den Berg and Bocker actually uh, uh, introduced uh, for the designers to follow uh, when they are uh, like designing the products as such. So the products should be designed for future proof, which means that they should last long and they should be uh, designed for use longer times. So last longer if they are uh, designed for, it's about performance, reliability and durability, whereas user long, uh, use longer time, it's about the consumer. So uh, it should be a roadmap beep and uh, adaptability and upgradability and so on. And then they should be also designed for disassembly. And so it, the products should be disassembled very easily so that they could infer the, uh, they could be recycled as such also. And then uh, they should be uh, designed for maintenance and reuse of the products. So this is very important because maintenance plays a really important po point, of course, in circularity of the products so that we can extend the life cycle. And uh, they should be easily uh, repairable or upgradable and as such. And also they should be uh, designed for recycling and reuse of the materials. So this is also very important because we want the, uh, all the material to get back and uh, reduce the, um, uh, re uh, reducing the uh, use of raw material and raw sources and as such. And uh, for this we did, of course, this, uh, it's not the circular economy is not as such a very simple path and it has a lot of challenges that companies faces uh, in this transition so adopting new uh, business models also requires for example adopting new technologies as such that we know that AI also plays a very important role so we did one study about the role of AI uh, in circular economy and uh, we figure we realized and identified that data is in the core of circular economy because it's very important we want to know where the products uh, coming from where are the uh, natural uh, source where are the sources and uh, also what happens to the product uh, during the life cycle of the product and how it is going to be for example reuse share reshare and, and and so on until it uh, goes back to the uh, recycling and upcycling point. So in this, uh, uh, in this regard, we've um, identified the role of AI. So in different phases, for example, in circular product design, we figured out that uh, AI can enable um, fast and smart uh, prototyping, which, re which reduces actually uh, the failure and, and downtime and also uh, helps in uh, identifying material toxicity and prediction and so on. And uh, so uh, 
by real-time data collection and analysis, it will help in uh, reducing uh, a great amount of uh, waste in uh, product uh, in product design. Uh, but also in supporting the customer, AI could help, of course, with digital platforms and database analysis uh, and extending the product lifecycle as such uh, uh, and so on. But uh, how, we, how AI could be used in reuse and share. Uh, so as we know, there are many platforms that are uh, now uh, used, for example, that we could uh, share the products. And we could also uh, sell our, resell our products and such. So there is intelligence in maintenance and re, uh, also it could be uh, helping in remote monitoring. So intelligence product life cycle and as such. Uh, but the main thing may be uh, also that uh, AI and, uh, could be used because all of these are still in uh, in very uh, phase of just talking about not most of the companies are using it that they cannot use it because AI as such uh, first of all they need the skill people to use this AI and programming and also understanding what it could do for the circularity of the company but also uh, it is as such a little bit costly in many cases for many companies also and uh, but uh, what's uh, at this moment, for example, is uh, one of the companies uh, also in Finland what's doing is Zen Robotics, for example, they are using AI and machine vision actually to in sorting the waste. So uh, it's uh, really uh, use uh, like the utilizing of AI in, in sorting waste. It, it helps in optimizing the value of the products, of course, and and. Uh, value of the recycled material because this AI with the use of AI uh, visions they can also not only identify the product and the material but also they can uh, identify for example the capacity of these waste and everything so it's also easier uh, and also safer for because uh, you don't want a human to be there and it's so uh, risky and work for, and hard work also for humans to do. Uh, so uh, regarding to this, uh, well, uh, we found also that data is very important. It plays a very important role in uh, for AI because basically uh, these technologies are all linked to data so they cannot like they are there because uh, they can uh, transfer data they can analyze huge amount of data and as such like that uh, so we know that uh, transparent data and, and material and, and components are enabling the measuring of impact production and on material and then also creating pure and high quality fit stock and also data for driven for data driven circular business model can be uh, used also on uh, product design and production, which is really important, and also for the uh, use space and customer behavior for product services, system performance, and all the material flows. So we need data so that AI could be capable of helping in this transition and enabling this transition to our circular economy. Uh, so to wrap it up, I have two case examples. The first one is my favorite. Uh, so <laughs> the case of AI whiskey, actually, uh, which was uh, like developed uh, on two, in 2019 by McMara uh, company and uh, Forkine. So McMara is the, uh, of course, uh, uh, whiskey uh, like a producer company since 1999, and uh, Forkine is the machine learning uh, service consultancy in in Finland. Uh, but uh, McMara wanted to have a celebration on their 20th of an anniversary of the company, so they wanted to do something very innovative. So they uh, uh, had uh, been partner with Forkine, and they ended up uh, like developing the first AI whiskey ever in the world that is totally uh, built and developed by AI. So uh, by use of uh, Microsoft Azure and Mac Machine Learning Studio, they this uh, AI system, they had analyzed 70 million possible combinations and of uh, AI, the uh, 
the recipes and then also they created the best one based on the consumer uh, needs and consumer behavior, what consumers buy the most. And also they evaluated the uh, the feedbacks of the customers. So uh, the uh, and based on the reviewers uh, reviews of this AI whiskey, it actually has the highest review. So uh, they are very successful in it but what how the ai is used is that faster and more uh, of course cost efficient way of innovation processes because these products don't need to be manufactured and released for customer or feedback but also the better product market also fits to this mathematical and evolving machine learning model and uh the last case uh, or the second case that I have is the uh, the Yell system company in Finland also. Uh, so they are using uh, the, these um, AI and uh, machine visions and algorithms actually for farming and uh, they are also the service uh, company so they are uh, like offering the uh, artificial and intelligence and uh, ai based analytics services to farmers uh, so that they are using this digital uh, phenotyping and uh, by recording the videos and uh, by use of mobile apps the farmers could actually monitor uh, the farm without needing to go but they can also uh, monitor the condition uh, the condition of, of uh, you know about for example uh, the condition of the corpse the condition of the disease symptoms and amount of the grains in plots and everything so and it all this data is based on real-time data so it uh, comes directly uh, to the mobile app and they can get any any information so it accelerates, of course, the actual plant breeding cycles, and also it helps breeding better plants uh, for carbon sequestration, and also reducing the need for uh, much fertilizer as such. And they are helping in reducing emission, and uh, also the uh, the farmers are uh, capable of uh, accessing to the data on agri-food value chain, the whole value chain. So this is what they are doing and they are helping uh, so much in farming uh, for the circularity. So uh, I think this is uh, my, I can end it here. So thanks, thank you all for listening. I hope that it kind of be informative for everybody. Malha, thank you very much. V very interesting, and, and particularly your your case study of the first AI generated whiskey is a really interesting example. I again, I, I invite the audience to to type in some questions in the in the Q and A uh, box of of the webinar. But while we wait for a question, there was a a phrase you used at the beginning of your your slides there: transparent data. And I'm just thinking about that being quite a, a tricky term because it, it, you're talking there about data that can be openly used or that that's that, that are yes. not, they're not bogged down with, with privacy or or maybe you know IPR and, and, and other issues or or can you expand yeah. on that a little bit? Yeah, well, uh, transparent data is, of course, very important because we want to know, like, if we think about ecosystem, like, first of all, we we know that companies cannot do it alone to be circular, like completely circular. So they have to collaborate with their ecosystem. So with the, all the partners, like uh, where the product comes from, uh, for example, from the uh, suppliers of these raw materials to the manufacturing companies, to the, uh, like, uh, the transport system, to the whole supply chain as such to the retailers to all, all, all end customers so we need this data so that we can enable because if we don't know how the customers are for example using it, this uh, like specific product for example if they want to share if they want to maintain uh, do the maintenance service if they want to repair or such as like that so how could we design the product which is actually uh, used or in in line with this uh, circular economy so the data which is going on and which is um, 
and like uh, flowing on, let's say, material flow is very important. But the, there is this problem of, of course, uh, the privacy. There is this problem of openness. So not everyone who wants to share, of course, there is the problem of competitiveness. Uh, so it also, you know, makes this uh, like risk of losing your um, uh, markets because the, then everybody knows about it, what you're doing. So uh, that's why it's still in the very uh, phase of like theory as such. We couldn't find where, like there is one, uh, let, let's say there is one project that uh, it's about textile in, in uh, um, circular ID, which has been with the circular fashion in Germany. They have been working on this uh, uh, data and transparency of ecosystem uh, for textile and fashion, but of course they cannot get many company because of the privacy that you mentioned. So they cannot get many company, but we see that it's very important because without this data, uh, we don't know the material flow, we don't know what will happen to the product uh, life cycle, and it's very important, uh, but we don't know about it. And uh, now that you see that this product passport is coming but it's all uh, also about data. So data is very important, but those are the challenges and you're right. So there, it's very challenging. We say that it should be transparent, especially the supply chain. It's very important that supply chain should be transparent because there is a huge uh, emission coming up from this supply chain. So the transparency is important, but I, I don't know where we, get, <laughs> we go and get to it also. Well, uh, Hugo, uh, in the in the Q and A, so if you if you want to read this uh, yourself, Malahat, I will I will read for the benefit of the audience. Uh, Hugo follows on from from my question there about asking, then how important are policy initiatives like the Open Data Directive and and European legislation on on open data, in trying to tackle that problem? Uh, and I know you've touched on that in your previous answer. Yeah, yeah, it is. Because now, for example, uh, this European Commission, they are discussing, as you know, all they're talking about uh, product passport. So product passport is not like our passport, for sure. It's like the this data that you can uh, just scan and get all the information about the manufacturer, about the product, all this material and everything. So I think in any case, it's not only about data, but also about the use of these technologies as such, like AI. There is a huge need, and there's so much discussion actually going around also on this uh, the, the the privacy and the regulations about how to use these technologies because you know, these technologies as such they are capable they are digital as such but still AI is programmed by human so this is very important what inputs you uh, give to it and as such the output you get so you know there's so much about this ethic. Uh, ethical AI or responsible AI, which is happening now, but I don't see that any uh, specific regulation. Well, there is uh, now also some regulations about AI in European Commission. They are talking about it. So it's coming, which also affects on the data as such, of course. But there's so much needed, I see, uh, still it, it, it's a lot needed. And also about the companies, for example, we did these uh, case studies and interviews in the uh, for 10 plus, uh, like the uh, startups in Finland to see, for example, how many of them are using AI as such, that we are talking about it a lot, but how much is it in theory rather than practice? So what we saw was that only uh, five out of 10 plus, as I said, like almost 20, uh, startup companies, even though they said that they are fully digitalized, but still uh, not uh, using AI because it's very challenging and very expensive for them. Yes, and, and uh, again, just to follow on, Hugo, as he's remarked, the, the, with the Open Data Directive mandating the release of that public sector data in, in free and open formats. Okay. You know, hopefully... That's a, that's a pathway forward, and I think yeah. uh, I think there's probably an, you, onus, uh, an onus on us all then to uh, to keep pushing for openness in data where and, and and whenever possible, so that you know the downstream effect can be that that more data is is available and and, and yes, more definitely. transparent. Yeah. So. Yes, definitely. 
So, Malahat, I am going to thank you for your, your contribution. Uh, a very interesting presentation and a, and thank a perspective you for having me. On, uh, on product design. Just in the, in the last couple of minutes before we finish up, I, I invite some general Q&A from the audience to, to any of our, our speakers and uh, or indeed general comments. And if, if any of the previous speakers wish to uh, take on, on one of the questions and answer, uh, please do. But uh, just while, while we're waiting, I have the, the closing slide for our uh, upcoming events. The IVI, the Innovation Value Institute, holds regular seminars like this uh, online. And uh, our next one is due in May, in about two months' time, on digital construction. So very related to some of the topics earlier on in our, our webinar today. You can keep in contact with us uh, in a number of ways. And uh, the IVI webpage at www.ivi.ie will have a link to the recording for today's uh, webinar, which will be available on the, on the YouTube channel. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen as I, I or can't see the, oh, I have managed to see seen the Q&A again, but if there's any comments as well from the other, the other speakers, today, any closing remarks, uh, we'd be very happy to hear them, but we'll be wrapping up at uh, 4.30 or a few minutes beforehand. The thumbs up for a very, very good session. Uh, again, all of the speakers can, can see the Q&A there. David has mentioned that on transparent data, David would like to, to ask a question. What is the role of the sort of AI development for uh, post-competitive comparative economics as, as an instance? So I'm going to let the the four speakers, five speakers, look at that, and maybe if uh, if someone wishes to uh, to take on that question, I think Malahat is is coming in there. Uh, well, that's a good question, but also that uh, I have to say that we are um, we are just in the point that we are researching on this data and in which phases of the circular economy actually it is helpful and and uh, and so on. So this. Um, moment, I doubt that I have a certain and concrete answer for this. <laughs> but we could get back to you, you also when I have it, maybe from our future research. Okay, on that uh, point, I think we can uh, we can wrap up. Again, I, I thank our, our five speakers. So on, on behalf of the IVI, Salman, as the lead researcher on, on CERC AI, and, and myself, I thank the speakers again and I thank our, our audience, our live audience today for your interactions and questions and it's been a learning experience and an enlightening experience for myself and thank you again to the speakers and to those who will watch the YouTube recording in the future. So I'll bring this to a close and bid you goodbye.